Good, that didn't take long. Thank you very much, uh, uh, John, for raising expectations. We, I would like to thank the other organizers, Nick Lane and Bill Martin, uh, for, and myself for the invitation. <laughs> we, we've heard that the 2002 meeting was a life-changing experience. That's a compliment. I think this meeting is, uh, that has the same potential. Um, and can we apply now for another one in 2022? Yes. That would be good, wouldn't it? Um, I'm going to shut this, which is very dis not if that's okay, why? And <clears throat> in this talk, I'm going to attempt to answer a why question, okay? Warning. And um, this is the title slide. Uh, it's energy, fidelity, and sex. Oh, yes, there's the word is there. Oocyte mitochondrial DNA is a protected genetic template. Now... Uh, we have seven co-authors, and clearly there's only one of me here speaking, um, and each of these people have contributed a lot to uh, what I'm going to say. This is not to say that they necessarily agree with the conclusion that I've come to on the basis of experiments they helped us do. So they, by agreeing to appear, they've signed a blank check. Um, Ahmed Noor Ajib, Fanis Misalis, um, who's now at... Sinvestav in Mexico, Rachel Ashworth, who's still at Queen Mary but will still soon be moving to Barts and the London uh, School of Medicine and Dentistry from Biological and Chemical Sciences, Kathy Lucas from the University of Southampton National Oceanography Centre, uh, Hema Visay Barena at King's College London uh, Centre for Ultrastructural Imaging, and uh, Wilson de Paula uh, at Queen Mary University of London, who is the lead investigator in this, and in a sense he should be speaking because the res new results I'm going to present um, are pretty well all obtained by Wilson. You'll be hearing this name several times during my talk. Um, I want to start with, if you didn't know, mitochondria. Uh, it's not mitochondrium which is what Scandinavians think is the single. I don't know why it's Greek. They, are, they power animal and plant cells. I like to think of them as domesticated bacteria. As we domesticate wild species for our own purposes, the first thing we do is control their reproduction. This is what the eukaryotic cell did with mitochondria. And during this domestication... The bacteria that they once were relinquished many genes to the nucleus of the host cell. Um, and there are no few genes left in mitochondria. 13 protein coding genes in the case of vertebrates, perhaps even all animals, including mammals, including humans, encoding a lot less than 1% of mitochondrial proteins. And so why didn't all the genes leave? Um, I proposed, and this was 10 years ago, uh, this hypothesis, which I called core, the genes, certain genes could not leave because they had to be co-located with their gene products to permit redox regulation of precisely the kind that Carl Bauer told us about so beautifully for photosynthetic uh, bacteria uh, earlier today. And um, this, I'm not going to... I, I could spend the rest of the day telling you about this, but briefly the predictions of the core hypothesis include redox regulation of mitochondrial gene expression. It applies equally to chloroplasts, of course, but for, for mitochondria, we predict redox regulation of gene expression by means of redox signaling components inherited from the ancestral endosymbiont. Number three, when mitochondria lose their function in energy conversion, they also lose their genomes because that's why they've kept their genomes. Um, and if you want uh, the definitive Ten Commandments, as people put it unkindly, there's a, a page on my website um, where you can hear more about that. I'm going to summarize. Once upon a time, there was a bacterium with a respiratory electron transport chain plugged into its uh, plasma membrane and then an outer membrane. All the proteins are colored uh, sort of brown. Um, the genes are colored brown just for illustrative purposes. The DNA makes RNA, makes protein, which is assembled into these complexes which carry out energy transduction. 
Um, and I want to say that redox regulation, in other words, feedback from biological electron transfer to control gene expression is fundamental and important uh, and is in all bacteria. And it was in this bacterium. And then after it became an endosymbiont, um, here was the host cell. The bacterium hadn't noticed yet that it had become an endosymbiont. It just kept on doing this. But over a period of time, there was relocation of genes to the nucleus to make precursor proteins for re-import back into the same location in which the original gene products had been in what, in what had been a bacterium. And it's now the mitochondrion, and it's the mitochondrial inner membrane. And the color coding, which is brown for mitochondrial DNA encoded uh, and light uh, yellowish color for uh, nuclear encoded and imported as a precursor um, explains roughly what is going on. And this is a sort of Mickey Mouse um, cartoon. And I've hastily uh, uh, redrew complex one. Um, uh, that is not it. This is the obsolete version from 10 years ago in the light <coughs> of uh, Sazanov giving uh, a wonderful talk here this morning. Uh, and that actually is the paper that came out of the, the, the the meeting in 2002, um, where I drew, for which I drew this diagram. Now, if that's correct, it provides some sort of explanation of why mitochondria still have genes and why chloroplasts still have genes. They could have got rid of everything, uh, but they didn't. Why not for redox regulation? But having genes in mitochondria uh, comes at a serious price. There is a penalty, and the penalty is that respiratory electron transfer is inherently dangerous. Toxic uh, intermediates are produced. And errors in electron transfer occur with fixed frequency, just in, as in complex one, as we heard in the first lecture. Transfers to the wrong electron acceptor, where wrong is in inverted commas because chemistry doesn't know right and wrong, it just does it, but it happens. And the products of these reactions damage mitochondrial genes, which then produce defective proteins which men then make more errors in electron transfer. Um, you can see where this is going. Damaging more genes, making more defective proteins, and so on. This is called, Lars Ernster called this, the vicious circle. And I drew this diagram to summarize. It's not my hypothesis. It's, it's, it's out there, but this is my summary. Um, having DNA in, a, in your mitochondrion to make respiratory chain proteins means that any mutation here will produce a defective protein, which, other things being equal, has got a greater chance of transferring an, its electron, if it's a redox carrier, onto oxygen as just one electron, which is the wrong thing to do because it makes the superoxide anion radical, which is itself mut mutagenic, as well as spawning a whole series of reactive oxygen species, which are themselves mutagenic. If you mutate mitochondrial DNA, you'll get more defective mitochondrial encoded proteins and so on. And around it goes. And this will, at the end, produce nucleocytosolic damage. And there is a, a broad feeling, and I think a lot of evidence in support of the proposition, that this is why we grow old and eventually die. Because in order to make ATP, for everything we do, we pay the penalty of gradually destroying our mitochondrial DNA. And in the end, there's nothing that evolution can do except throw away the individual and start again. And so even without that mitochondrial theory of aging, the mitochondrion is the worst imaginable place in the cell to keep genes. It's a highly reactive, um, redox-active uh, compartment. And whatever the reason for the persistence of mitochondrial genomes, it had better be a good one. If I, if I stand here, which I want to do, I'm certain to step back on and fall down the steps and break a leg. Whatever the reason for the persistence of mitochondrial genomes, it, it better be a good one. Right, the why question. Why are there two sexes? If the mitochondrial theory of aging is correct, it's pretty clear that it predicts that offspring might be expected to inherit their mother's acquired state of accumulated damage but they evidently do not. You will have noticed this. Can I say our first grandchild is expected in a week? I embarrass my wife out there. Um, we're pretty confident this baby is going to be starting again at time equals zero uh, and will not be born, born bald or with wrinkles or anything of this kind. 
Not that her mother has, is balded with wrinkles. Her, her mother is, is 25, I think, or something like that. But if the clock has proceeded to age 25, it will not be the case in the baby. So if the mitochondrial theory of aging is correct, um, good point, Bill. I, very, uh, I knew exactly what you were going to say. Um, uh, it starts again. So how can this happen? How can this be? Right, here's a hypothesis. Separation of two sexes allows specialization of mitochondria, either as genetic templates in the female germline or as energy converters in the male germline and all somatic cells of both sexes. So you're either a good genetic template, faithfully transmitting the information you carry to the next generation, or you've made that irreversible step to be a fuel cell um, making ATP by oxidative phosphorylation, which damages the DNA. And so if you've made that step, that mitochondria is no longer any good as a template. Therefore, the mitochondria can never be both. And what has happened is there is a fundamental dichotomy um, in complex life between a germline that will carry mitochondria uh, that are templates and a germline that will carry mitochondria that are not going to be templates. And so this is a diagram uh, redrawn from a paper I published in 1996. Here's an oocyte. This is, we could call it a pro-mitochondrion. I'm not sure whether prochondrion would be good enough. It would be simpler, which doesn't do ATP synthesis. It has DNA, but it doesn't transcribe it. Let's just suppose. And he, here are some... Uh, surrounding uh, somatic cells that do have real mitochondria making ATP, and that ATP can be imported to sustain the oocyte. Now, fertilization uh, occurs for reasons that geneticists will tell us about to do with recombination of genes so that a haploid nucleus can join with another haploid nucleus to make a new diploid individual. Fertilization requires motility but it requires motility of only one gamete. Motility requires ATP. ATP requires oxidative phosphorylation. The motile gamete is the sperm. It must have energetically competent mitochondria, which by definition are no good as templates. Therefore, mitochondria are maternally inherited because the template is what has to be passed on. So we have the zygote, and the prediction then is that the female somatic line uh, of cells, including everything in the, in the female, including ultimately the helper cells of the next generation, uh, contain the mitochondria that have differentiated to perform <laughs> oxidative phosphorylation. Males, the whole thing contains mitochondria that have differentiated to perform oxidative phosphorylation, the germline and the somatic line. But, and here's the key prediction, the female germline carries with it a sequestered population of cells that carry only that template at mitochondrion, and that template mitochondrion survives to the oocyte of the mother of the next generation, and so on. There's a, a, a life cycle of template mitochondria which is supported in order to populate uh, the whole of the rest of the, ne uh, the, the next generation, and therefore we would predict that oocyte mitochondria are, have, are repressed in transcription and are bioenergetically inactive. Oh, and that's female, the female line, and that's the male life cycle of mitochondria. Um, and that was published in 1996, uh, and it just sat there, uh, and it was one of these papers that produced a sort of staggering lack of interest from pretty well everyone except Nick Lane, to whom I thank for... Uh, reviewing this in his book, Oxygen, first of all, Oxygen, the molecule that made the world, thereby saving this hypothesis from oblivion, actually. I, it's probably where it would still be. So, mitochondria are maternally inherited. I call this a prediction. We already knew that. But an explanation is a hypothesis of something we already accepted but couldn't provide an explanation for. And that's a kind of prediction. Females, we might expect, would still have a time-limited reproductive capacity. Oocyte mitochondria might um, accumulate enough free radical damage eventually, even as genetic templates. 
to exceed a certain threshold of damage. So in other words, uh, females can't go on producing viable oocytes with template mitochondria indefinitely. Another consequence, and, and when this, again this is for experimental investigation, somatic reproductive cloning will produce bracket, uh, commas, elderly offspring if somatic mitochondria are inadvertently introduced into the oocyte. A famous example is Dolly, the first cloned mammal who died at the age of six of, age, of uh, diseases that would not normally occur in uh, a U until the age of 12 or 13. Could have been that that's what happened there. Don't know. One could have to investigate that. And experimental predictions. Oocytes, eggs, carry protected template mitochondria, which are sequestered at an early stage in female development. So if this is the picture of the mitochondria, and this is the redox regulation, Let's look at the mitochondrial electron transport chain. See, I redrew complex one. It's still terrible, but it's not quite as bad as, uh, uh, as it was before. Mitochondrially encoded, nuclearly encoded. Mitochondrially encoded, nuclearly encoded. Mitochondrial, nuclear, mitochondrial, nuclear. Broadly correct, and the number of subunits is not quite right, and the shapes and so on are, are pretty um, hopeless as well. But that's broadly the respiratory electron transport chain, and the mechanism of oxidative phosphorylation, where electron transport establishes a proton motive force, which is used to drive ATP synthesis. It's that, and the blue arrow represents electron transfer, and the red arrow is proton translocation. Um, I introduce this because we're now looking at evidence uh, that this doesn't happen in oocyte mitochondria. And the first thing is that a component of complex one is called NAD1. A component of complex three is called COB for cytochrome B. And a component of complex four uh, is called COX1. These are the gene names, NAD1 for, sub for NAD1 in protein, COB for cytochrome B, uh, in the complex three, COX-1 for cytochrome oxidase, subunit one in subunit four. And the first thing we did was get some fruit flies uh, worked on by Fanny Smissilis, which makes him a co-author, and he was hugely helpful with this, explaining to people um, who don't know a lot about fr animals, actually, um, how to get out different tissues and how to look at them. And this is where Wilson really swings into action. And the catalytic event was Noah Ajib, who did a fantastic final year project as a result of coming to my lab and saying, I'd like to do a final year research project with you. Great. On mitochondria. Wonderful. In animals. Oh, we don't have any animals in my lab. We work on proteins. And, um, and then I thought, well... Let's just try it out. Let's go and talk to Fanny Smissilis, who was a very approachable guy and very helpful. And he said, OK, well, we've got lots of fruit flies. What about those? And here is a fruit fly, which is our token protostome. And what Wilson and Noah together did was a simple, well, I say simple, a real-time PCR experiment uh, looking at NAD1, COB, and COX1 transcription relative quantities of messenger RNA in a fruit fly in its, for males and females in intestine, thorax, for the female's ovary. Uh, the ovary is mostly oocytes, but not entirely. And for the, for the male, intestine, thorax, and testis. And I have to tell you, I, mean, I'm going to, I have to look at Wilson here. He came back with this data, and we both looked at each other, and we said... We don't believe this. This is too good to be true. But it's true. And what this data now, after many replicates, is the, you see, you see the greatly reduced transcriptional quantity for all three of these mitochondrially encoded genes uh, in ovary and by implication in oocytes. And this is, um, this, is, this is a level playing field because the quantity of RNA for each of these genes is normalized to the quantity of RP49, a ribosomal protein which is nuclearly encoded. And then that ratio is normalized to the corresponding ratio for 
an innocuous somatic tissue, in this case intestine, that, which is by definition one. But you can still get error bars and do uh, a real statistical operation on this data. And you see that the difference between transcription of these three mitochondrial, uh, mitochondrial genes in mitochondria for respiratory chain components in the ovary is lowest of the lot. And if you compare, compare female and male gametes, um, the difference is obvious. So, uh, okay, well, maybe there's just something about flies, you know, or just something about fruit flies. And so, if we make a story out of this, we go, we think, well, how many other animals have we got around here, you know? So we go to see Dr. Rachel Ashworth, who is here, who, again, is very accommodating, doesn't quite understand what these slightly deranged people want to do with the zebrafish, uh, but she's got some, and she's very generous and very helpful. Um, and so we look at Danio, uh, the zebrafish, and Wilson does essentially the same experiment in a vertebrate. Oh, this is the point. Zebrafish is a deuterostome. And uh, the same applies. Here the reference uh, is uh, actin, which is a nuclear gene, transcription of actin. And then you take each of these mitochondrial genes' level of transcription divide it by the quantity of RNA for actin, which is encoded in the nucleus, and then divide that ratio by the uh, ratio that you get for, uh, in fact, uh, male, uh, female intestinal uh, cells. And here, you, again, you see uh, NAD1, COB1, and COX3 uh, are transcribed in mitochondria in intestine. Uh, this should read... Uh, thoracic, thorax, thoracic muscle, which is where they swim. So all those mitochondria are going to be pretty energetically active. Um, and the ovary is right down, it's repressed. Um, the males, intestine, muscle, testis, no comparable repression, almost pretty well indistinguishable uh, from intestinal mitochondria. So, well, you, one could sort of rest on one's laurels at this point, and, um, and a wonderful good colleague called Rob Hughes at Queen Mary was sort of pretty well there. He said, well, why don't you try a cnidarian, he said. And so I thought, what are cnidaria? No, are these what we used to call cylinderates? I think, I think they probably are, actually. And he said, I'll get you some if you like. And we said, well, thank you very much. That would be fine. And then he said, mind you, um, Andrew Hurst uh, might be able to get you some. So we went to Andrew Hurst and he sucked his teeth and wondered what on earth we were talking about. We're plant biochemists, by the way. And he said, I've, I know someone, I've got a collaboration uh, with Kathy Lucas in Southampton. Maybe she's got some. And so um, we get jellyfish, uh, which is uh, early branching, I think, is the modern euphemism for primitive. I still don't know. It depends which branch you think you're on to start with. Uh, um, <laughs> Anyway, here's jellyfish, and they're fine, and they're great, and they don't worry about dying, and they're all over the place, and they're not a threatened species, so it, it's uh, marvellous. And Kathy Lucas, may I, 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 it's, it's part of the narrative here. On the opening day of the Paralympics, arrived with her family at Waterloo Station, um, lovely family, uh, with Kathy clutching two buckets of jellyfish, one containing males, and the other containing females, and we met for the first time, and Cathy handed over these two buckets at, at, outside the gate of Platform 16 at Waterloo Station. And I'm not making this up, and Cathy's brought some more with her today because we need to do a... Um, we need to check their sperm, actually. That's what we need to do. So these are wonderful people. I mean, this is a model of how science should work. Relative quantities of MRA. Oh, nobody said, can we be on the paper? Or, you know, do you want... Can you pay us for the you know, time and all the rest of it? Uh, this was just done out of sheer curiosity or perhaps um, uh, sympathy for mildly deranged people who wanted to do strange experiments with exotic species. But here it is. Look, the ovary is right down again. Here we have oral arm. Um, here we have bell. I don't know whether in invertebrate zoology bell is the correct term, but it looks like a bell. The transcription is right down for these same three mitochondrial genes. And yes, jellyfish uh, have little boy jellyfish and little girl jellyfish, um, which I, th I didn't quite know whether they um, 
were uh, monoecious or dioecious, which you don't use for animals, but here it is. And the testis, of course, it has very high... These uh, have external fertilization, so that sperm really has to m maybe swim a long way and have particularly active mitochondria, but the ovary is right down again. So that's the transcription. Oh, and there the, it's normalized with reference to tubulin, which is a nuclear gene, and then that, that ratio is normalized again uh, to one. Uh, help, I don't quite exactly. I was probably oral arm female here, just for the purposes of comparison. So we've got fruit fly. We've got, uh, oh, right. Um, all right, that's transcription. What are the mitochondria actually doing? And this is, uh, again, Wilson's and um, Noah started with Drosophila. This is a Drosophila. And I'm now going to be talking about the oocyte, which Drosophilists is, use as a term to denote what I would call an ovary. In other words, it's, it's a collection of cells, including the haploid and the diploid surrounding <coughs> tissue, I believe. Here's a bright field micrograph. Um, this is a transgenic line. Oh, that's a dirty word. Sorry, I hope there's nobody checking here. This is a Drosophila line from the Indiana University. Drosophila, where's Carl? Drosophila um, um, culture, collect, culture collection for Drosophila. You see my whatever it's called, fl flyarium or something. <laughs> Um, and you write to these people, and they very kindly send you a line of Drosophila, which has yellow fluorescent protein attached to uh, a, a given a mitochondrial target sequence. Uh, this is green, uh, and nevertheless, Wilson tells me it's yellow fluorescent protein, and I think probably the explanation has something to do with the spectral sensitivity uh, of the detector uh, in the microscope. Um, and so this just says, where are the mitochondria? Um, and this, uh, they're not in the nuclei. These are the nuclei, these great black holes in the middle. But they're in the surrounding uh, cytosol uh, of these oocytes and neighboring cells. You see a ring around the outside uh, in Drosophila melanogaster. And then um, you take uh, a marker, which is a variety of the dimitotracker, which is specific for mitochondria which have a proton motive force. It doesn't fluoresce, or else, or perhaps it's not... No, no it's taken up, but it doesn't fluoresce uh, in mitochondria unless they have an active proton motive force. So here are the mitochondria in the oocyte, uh, in inverted commas, and here are the mitochondria that have a protein, proton motive force in the oocyte. Can you tell the difference? These are the surrounding diploid uh, nurse cells with their active mitochondria, which you see from red, and you do the overlay, and you get this. So green is all mitochondria. Green plus red tells you where there are mitochondria that also have a proton motive force. And it's perfectly clear that the haploid oocytes have mitochondria, but they don't have a proton motive force. So we've got to do that with zebrafish now. I mean, just in case there's, it's all gone wrong. Bright field... In zebrafish, there is a, a, a GFP mitochondrial line of zebrafish. You have to purchase it from Korea. This is illegal. You can't import it into the UK. I have no idea why. And it's South Korea as well, so I think the strategic implications of getting uh, GFP mitochondrial labelled zebrafish from South Korea are rather small, but it's not allowed. You can't do it. If anybody's going to Korea and doesn't mind... Oh, no, no, I mustn't say that. Huh? <laughs> so this is just mitotracker this time, um, which tells you where the mitochondria are. Mitotracker green, and this is mitotracker red, which tells you where the mitochondria are that have a proton motive force, and I'd like to see the chemical explanation of this, but it's in the literature, um, so we have to hold on to, you know, little bits of accepted uh, bases, premises for our argument. And this is the overlay of this. Oh, I should have said this is the overlay of this and this at twice scale, 25 micrometers. Um, so zebrafish mitochondria in uh, a zebrafish ovary look like this. And again, there are lots of green ones that report that there are mitochondria present. But the red ones that are reporting that there are mitochondria with a proton motive force are only ever around the periphery of the, uh, the egg cell itself. The egg cell has bioenergetically inactive mitochondria. 
Zebrafish, well, jellyfish, let's see. And here the bright field microscopy uh, makes the jellyfish egg cells look this, like this. The mitotracker green says where are the mitochondria. The mitotracker red says where are the mitochondria that are sustaining a proton motive force. The haploid egg cell has mitochondria, but they're not actually uh, generating a proton motive force. And that's the overlay of that one plus that one. So you, again, you can see the color contrast here. So, um, ah, next, next set of experiments, back to fruit flies. Well, this is all very well, but what are the mitochondrial morphology? Well, this is Drosophila flight muscle. Uh, this is what I call a mitochondrion. I mean, you can put this on the cover of a book. I mean, that's, that's just great. I mean, there's Christie and the whole works there. And it's big, and it's na on, just on the neighboring, adjoining, uh, a real skeletal muscle, which enables the Drosophila to fly around, which is demonstrably an energy-requiring activity. This is the Drosophila... Oocyte, same scale, 500 nanometers. That's what the mitochondria look like. That's one mitochondrion in a Drosophila oocyte. That's the same mitochondrion, but in a Drosophila flight muscle. What do you think's going on there? Not a lot. Um, whenever looking at oocytes, you always see the things completely uh, packed with ribosomes, ready to, to go, awaiting instructions to begin protein synthesis after fertilization. This is the nucleus here. Um, zebrafish, don't want to labor the point. Zebrafish heart, heart muscle. Uh, here's you know, classic uh, sliding filament type uh, muscle EM. Uh, this is uh, what a mitochondria looks like. It looks a bit more like Rhodobacter capsulatus to me, but I mean, it's got a hell of a lot of internal membranes, even if they're not arranged in these Christi. Um, and this is what a zebrafish oocyte, mitochondrion, looks like. Same scale. And here are all the ribosomes to prove that we're looking inside an oocyte. Now, I am aware that this looks a bit like advertising. I can't just get, sh show you two picture electron micrographs and say, hey, look at the difference, because you don't know where we got them. You need statistics, you need sampling, and all the rest of it. So these electron micrographs, for the purposes of this presentation, are for illustrative purposes only. Okay? But it really does look like that, and it doesn't matter which species you get it from. So uh, there we are. Um, we've got... Uh, I got to jellyfish. I haven't got to jellyfish. That was zebrafish. Um, this is the bell, as we call it. I'm sorry if that's the wrong word. Here are the mitochondria, and here's a jellyfish oocyte. Now, they're a little bit bigger, uh, but they're internally um, morphologically uh, fairly uniform. Uh, they don't have this extended internal membrane system. So it all begins to fit. Don't you think it begins to fit? So this is our tree of life. Um, I've left off origin of life from the bottom of the screen here. It really is on the original one. The reason we chose this, and it is, is from the Open University and the BBC. And Iskander Ibrahim brought this in and put it on the wall in the lab. Um, and what we've got, uh, first of all, is Drosophila melanogaster here which is an insect, which is a protostome, and this blue line here, annelids, arthropods, mollusks are all protostomes. Um, and we've got zebrafish. We don't have zebrafish exactly. We have Finding Nemo here as our colorful example of the deuterostomes, uh, which includes the vertebrates, which includes us, um, well, Charles Darwin at least, and the jellyfish, a different species of jellyfish, off this early branch in the Cnidaria. So what we think and what we hope is that this generalization that oocyte mitochondria don't do transcription, don't have a proton motive force, and there's some more data I'm not going to show for reasons of time on reactive oxygen species. All of this obtained by Wilson in the end, especially the zebrafish. Yes, Noah came in and helped a lot with the Drosophila, but it was just a finally a project, so... Um, he had to be forced over the lab sometimes, and um, Wilson had to sort of call taxis at 2 a.m. because he'd forgotten that they'd missed the last tube. These people are motivated. They don't work 37-hour weeks, let me tell you. This is a borderline obsession. But we have the whole, the whole bloody animal kingdom covered, really, because we've got a sample here and a sample here and a sample here. So... 
That's it. We, we, the, that's the conclusion. That's all we've got. We can systematically work our way through prosobranch mollusks, if you wish, but I think the inference is pretty clear. This is going to be everywhere. Humans? Well, of course, we're just mammals, aren't we? Well, the mammals aren't, aren't that interesting, really. I'm with Paul. Nothing really interesting happened in biology after 2.4 bill, uh, giga years when oxygen, oxygenic photosynthesis was <coughs> discovered. But there's a reason. Now, is it true that the template mitochondria become bioenergetically competent mitochondria and never go back? Now, we don't know that. That's an assumption. We need to do more research on that. If there are any benefactors or representatives of research councils out there, that's, that's a big problem we, we have to address. But I'm going to give you an argument as to why that should be. Behind my title slide is a distinguished portrait of this gentleman. This gentleman is August Weisman, uh, 1834 to 1914. It's not generally known. Weissmann was the anti-Lamarck person. Darwin had no problem with Lamarck. What Weissmann said was that there is a germ plasm. All organisms' uh, inheritance takes place by means of germ cells, gametes such as egg cells and sperm cells, and other cells of the body, the somatic cells, or the soma, do not function as agents of heredity. The effect is one way. This is just from Wikipedia, by the way. Germ cells produce somatic cells and are not affected by anything the somatic cells learn or experience, uh, or they're, they're not affected by any ability the body acquires during its life. That's the opposite of what Mark said, uh, Lamarck said, which is the giraffe strives to re aspires to reach higher and its aspiration somehow distills into its germ cells and so on and so on. Um, so genetic information cannot pass from soma to germplasm and on to the next generation. This is referred to as the Weismann barrier. I think if there's a Weismann barrier in biology, there will be a Weismann barrier for mitochondria as well. It's just an argument. It's not evidence. We need evidence. And I got this, actually, for three and six from W.H. Smith in Newport Mon, my hometown, uh, when I should have been revising for my A-levels, I bought John Maynard Smith's The Theory of Evolution, uh, second edition, and he put this very clearly. Uh, germplasm makes soma, germplasm makes soma, germplasm makes soma, and germplasm comes only from pre-existing germplasm. And this was the so-called central dogma. Everyone agrees that's a stupid name for a scientific theory because there is no room for dogma in science. And I think it was a joke on the part of Crick, or at least a reference to his classical education, because in Latin, dogma doesn't mean certain truth that stands irrespective of evidence. It simply means a proposition or something you hold on to as a basis by which uh, mean to advance an argument. But of course, DNA makes RNA makes protein. DNA makes protein was good enough for Maynard Smith in 66, and that's good enough for, for now. He wrote beautifully, 8A, Weissman's theory is shown in diagrammatic form, and 8B is shown what Crick has called the central dogma of molecular genetics. People got very excited about that and said, this is not a dogma. A dogma which states that information can flow from nucleic acids to proteins, but cannot flow from protein to nucleic acids. So that would be the Weissman barrier. Uh, accepting, I mean, a poem here was uh, Maynard Smith's PhD student, accepting for a moment the truth of the central dogma, it could account for the correctness of Weismann's view in the following way. If an organism is raised in a new environment, this may alter the relative amounts or dispositions of different types of protein molecules. As a biochemist, I think that's okay, actually. In such a way as to render the organism better able to survive in the new conditions. But if the central dogma is true, this cannot cause an equivalent change in hereditary material or DNA, and so cannot cause the adaptation to be transmitted to the next generation. Um, so there we have it. And what I would submit is that mitochondria, we've studied them. The pioneers isolated them. They did the biochemistry. The Krebs cycle is in there. Oxidative phosphorylation in their mitochondria are thought of as biochemical entities primarily. And there was a lot of resistance to the idea that they had genes at all in the 60s. Um, Jeff Schatz, uh, okay, no, there were other people who showed that there was DNA in there, but I'll come back to Jeff in a moment. So we think of 
mitochondria is the embodiment of the soma. They produce all the energy. That's all they do. We don't think of them as carrying uh, units of information onto the next generation, but they do. And I would say the Weismann barrier applies to mitochondrial transmission just as much as it applies to the transmission of nuclear genes. And so Wilson not only has done all these fantastic experiments, but he's produced this uh, d diagram uh, rather similar to the one I showed you before, but much nicer. Template mitochondria. Oxidative phosphorylation occurs in the sperm, which produces, allows fertilization, which produces a diploid zygote. 2N means uh, diploid. The mitochondria are still oocyte mitochondria for all practical purposes. And then in embryogenesis, there is a sorting of mitochondria that uh, go off uh, to the right, to make male somatic cells and then the male germ line and then uh, meiosis for the sperm to be equipped to fertilize an egg next time round. Um, and then uh, the female somatic line, the same applies. There's nothing wrong with females' mitochondria. Uh, they make just as good human, in human terms, athletes as anybody else. Um, but suppose the Weissman barrier forbids the conversion of one of these mitochondria into one of these mitochondria, what you'll have to do is have a continual female germline. And, I th and then, of course, follicle cells will be somatic helper cells, which will provide the ATP to help out the mitochondria that are unable to do oxidative phosphorylation themselves. And when you've got to that state, you can have uh, meiosis, uh, and create a female gamete ready to be fertilized by the male gamete the next time round. So, am I overrunning? Mitochondria evolve from bacteria. They're chemical fuel cells. They're not batteries. They're fuel cells that provide all their energy. They retain their own genes and genomes in order to do so. And they mostly destroy themselves and eventually us in consequence. But they exist also in female gam gametes, oocytes, eggs, as quiescent, protected genetic templates incapable of energy conversion, and from which all other mitochondria derive. And I think we've established evidence in favor of that final proposition. If this is correct, male, I learned at school, is that sex which produces a large number of small, mobile gametes. Female is that sex which produces a small number of large, immobile gametes. I'd like to propose something simpler. Male is that sex in which gamete mitochondria perform oxidative phosphorylation. Female is that sex in which gamete mitochondria do not perform oxidative phosphorylation. Wilson's great with graphics. Uh, this is the research lab circa 2010. We have to look like this in the east end of London just to sort of uh, look fierce. And, uh, um, <laughs> And nobody comes in, and they come in, and they come in and steal your computer anyway. But um, but uh, but here we are. You wouldn't mess with this lot. It's Fang Huang, Wilson himself, me, Sujit now in, in uh, Washington State University, and Iskander Ibrahim. You heard Sujit talking about his and Iskander's work uh, yesterday on chloroplast sensor kinase. The Leverhulme Trust co-investigators are Andrew Cumming, Norbert Kraus, uh, who's here, and Brendan Curran, uh, who is here. And 2012, we have. Noah, who's hanging around after his final year, pro outstanding final year project, uh, and we'd love to have him on as a PhD student. Um, and then we have uh, new recruit Liang Wang, funded by the uh, China Scholarship Council. Um, I've got to spend a little time on acknowledgements, uh, if you'll allow me, uh, Mr. Chairman. This is the Leverhulme Trust Research Group meeting. Uh, this is the lot of us. These are photographs of people you can actually recognize rather than the mafia mob uh, standing on top of Mile End Bridge. Um, there's um, Fang, Noor, Norbert, me, Brendan Curran, Andy Cumming, Wilson de Paula, uh, Sujit, and Iskander Ibrahim. Um, acknowledgements, Queen Mary University of London, uh, and uh, there are facilities and resources, zebrafish, drosophila, microscopy, uh, which we're grateful for. Um, I, for 2012-2013, have a formal affiliation with the Research Department of Genetics, uh, Evolution and Environment at UCL, for which I'm very grateful, and I hope to be able to 
get things going on this in that environment. Um, these, uh, this is personal. I can't ask all seven co-authors to even know who these people are. But in 1995, when I had this idea of separate sexes and mitochondrial aging, after going to a Gordon conference in Volterra in Italy, uh, and met Jeff Schatz for the first time, I came back and wrote a proposal, uh, the first of my grant applications to work on this that failed. There have been many others. And Lars Enster was very supportive and liked this idea a lot. And I was hugely appreciative of that because Lars Enster was a, a major figure in, bio, in bioenergetics. So my first question, is this stupid? And Lars Enster said, no, no, this is a very good idea. And I could have knocked me over. And I said, it's just a hypothesis. And he looked at me and said, that's what we do. Um, have you ever been? And then um, I invite, after the Gordon Conference, I was, I was in a position then to be able to say, let's get this guy to give a seminar. Jeff Schatz came from Basel. Now, he was a pioneer of mitochondrial uh, DNA-making proteins to us. He asked the question, does the mitochondrial DNA make all the proteins of the mitochondria? And he found that wasn't true. And he was a brilliant guy. And so the next question you ask is, if it's not stupid, is, is it already known? Has everybody knew this already? And I was walking to the hovercraft terminal. This is before they built the bridge between Malmo and Copenhagen, and Jeff had to go back. And I said, well, thank you. I, I, it's a very nice talk, Jeff. Just one thing. I was thinking of looking at um, transcription and maybe um, studying oocyte mitochondria in, say, Xenopus or something. And he had, had to go. He said, John... Don't waste your time with Xenopus mitochondria, mitochondria. We tried that years ago. Well, I can't even remember. We published it, but they're so boring. They've got no cytochromes, no ATP synthesis. <laughs> Don't waste your time with oocyte mitochondria. And I said, and then, of course, I, I expressed more than, uh, more interest in that. He'd just been saying, you know, you're a very nice man. He meant this sincerely. And I said, I said is this published? And he said, well, I don't think so. Um, it's just in all the old textbooks, I forget. And I've not found it. So if anybody here knows that there's, there are papers saying that your site mitochondria do nothing at all, please let me know. John, Bill, Nick. Nick uh, saved the hypothesis from oblivion. John and Bill have put up with me talking about this for some years. And Carol has done more than put up with it. She's had fueled the interest and had lots of good suggestions and ideas. My wife, Carol, who all these people are here. Jeff Schatz isn't. Lars Einstein is no longer with us. Thank heavens for the Leverhulme Trust, which is one research funding body that understands that research is something you do to find out things you didn't already know. <laughs> in, in stark contrast to at least one of the UK research councils in my personal experience. I can say that in my personal experience. Um, so we thank them. And the, here are all the people who, the ex other people, uh, taking up an inordinate amount of time here uh, involved in this. Uh, here's Rob who said, hey, why don't you try some Nidaria? Just, just like that. Um, Fanny's is now moved from Queen Mary to here, to Mexico. Rachel is moving from SBCS to Barton, the London. Uh, the zebrafish stay in uh, Mile End, I think that's. I uh, hope. And Kathy was just so generous, uh, unbelievable, told us all about jellyfish, or, you know, a beginner's guide, Jellyfish 101, and then actually brought us some. Uh, very nice indeed. And then the electron microscopy was done at King's College London. Um, and Hema, uh, Vise Barena, got involved and interested uh, and did all the nice things for us. Uh, I thought I didn't have a picture of Fanny and Rachel, but I do, and this is it, and this is the one slide I have stolen without permission from somebody else's lecture. Um, uh, this was uh, in November last year, and I don't think pensions were actually uh, what were on their mind. Um, this is Wilson, uh, obsessed with our new experimental material, and this is uh, what they look like, and I could even start that running the, that's a female, Kathy told us. You can see the fertilized eggs on these arms here. That's a male, because uh, uh, possibly, or maybe a virgin female. And this was taken within minutes of putting the males and females in the same tank together for the first time, and their over, overwhelming joy at being in each other's company <laughs> uh, is there. I could leave, it only lasts one minute. Shall I leave it going and say thank you very much? Uh, uh,
Thanks very much, John. At the risk of annoying those who uh, have doubtless have the lunch ready for us, we must have a few questions on this. So sorry, I've, I, I've overrun. I always do that. Yeah, yeah. Yes. A question here. Uh, David Lloyd, Cardiff. John, you said there's not much going on in these all-site mitochondria. Do you think perhaps there's an analogy that we know more about, and that is the mitosome of these low-oxygen eukaryotes? I mean, might, one might predict that the only thing that's going on in there is the synthesis of the iron sulfur clusters. Well, that's right. Has anyone looked at this? Well, they, yes. I mean, this is, again, ten years ago. My life was changed when uh, Yuri A. Tovar came and said, I work on mitosomes. And I said, what are they? He said, well, they're mitochondria, but they've lost oxidative phosphorylation, and they've lost all their DNA. So it, it's an extreme case where the thing is no longer required to do regulation of gene expression because that's not, it's not in that business anymore. It has a different function entirely. That's right. Mm. But, of course, there's a good deal known about the mitosomes more than that now, about the transport proteins mm. in that double membrane. And I would like to ask you if the scale bars on your, your uh, electron micrographs were one micron scale bars? 500 nanometers, half I a micron. I see. So those oocyte mitochondria really are very small. That's right. They're That's... about 150 nanometers at a guess. That would very seem small, to be, that's which it. is, you know, what the mitosome yes. in Jardia is. You'd for mistake instance. it for a mitosome. It'll still have the DNA, but it's not being uh, well, transcribed well, and it's well, not making an inner ah, membrane. Yes, yeah. well, well, that's different, of mm. course. Yeah. Mm. Because the mitosome in Jardia, for instance, doesn't have any DNA. Thank you. Uh, Nick Lane, UCL. Uh, beautiful presentation. Uh, Don't believe data. a word of it. <laughs> uh, having having um, saved the, <laughs> being accused of saving it from oblivion, which is not true at all, uh, there are, though, a few ugly little facts that I feel obliged to raise. I do think it's time to move on to lunch now, John. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, ju just, just thoughts. I mean, this is, this is not necessarily uh, opposing the theory, but they're things that I don't see immediately how it would explain. So there are plenty of isogametic species among single-celled eukaryotes mm -hmm. around um, where the two gametes are exactly the same and they're both motile, but only one of them passes on the mitochondria. Um, so you have, in effect, if not two sexes, at least two mating types, yes. uh, but both are motile. Another question is, what about chloroplasts? They're also uniparently inherited but not involved in motility either, and sometimes they're inherited paternally rather than maternally. They can be inherited down the opposite, uh, in, in the opposite sperms, uh, gender. For example. And then thirdly, um, mutation rates uh, vary enormously between species. So Drosophila, uh, the evolutionary rate of mitochondrial DNA is about double the, 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 the nuclear average, whereas in, in primates it's about 40 times faster. In birds it's somewhat slower. Uh, it seems to be under selection. How do you account for uh, a, a, an inactive template? So just, que just questions, but... Uh, uh, absolutely. I mean, I agree. I, mean, I, I have no answer to, I mean, pertinent observations that are not accounted for by this hypothesis, which doesn't mean to say it's wrong. It means there are other things we haven't taken into consideration. That's my um, defence, really, Nick. Right. Mm. There are questions behind. I think it was covered. Yeah. Okay. Right. Um, any further? Oh, we a question in the back there. Two questions in the back. I've, I've got the microphone, so can I ask a question? <laughs> um, it, Chris Howe from Cambridge. It's actually the same point that Nick made, to, to ask John how you account for things like chlamydomonas, where, where you have the, the, the mitochondrion and the chloroplast coming from the opposite mating types. And um, I can see that the, this theory is attractive for the, the small and insignificant groups of organisms yeah. that have a germline, but, yeah. but not for, for most others. No, I mean, uh, this is, I'm talking about an isogametic sex. There is isogametic sex, which serves the same function as recombination. And yes, there are lines in which uh, mitochondria are not transmitted into the zygote, and there are lines in which the plastid is not transmitted. And those can, those can be complementary lines. And um, I can't explain this. I, I, I ended up in... 
2002 burned in my brain, saying to Tom Cavalier-Smith, I can't explain everything, but if I've explained something, then I'm happy. And um, these are good points, and that's for future research. That's all I can say. Uh, so, uh, Paul Falkowski from Rutgers. John, um, let me ask you, what happens when you fertilize the egg? So what... Do you, do you imagine now that the mitochondria, which are lined up next to all these ribosomes and yep. have to be activated very rapidly in order to produce a huge amount of ATP, are then there's one mitochondria that's sitting out there doing nothing? That's what we have to do, Paul, and that's what I want to know. So and that's what it predicts. There, in other words, the first cell division uh, retains one cell where the mitochondria don't become differentiated. The next cell division, you've got four cells. Well, it could be one or it could be two, but it's got to be one and no less than one where there is still template mitochondria. And you go on and you end up with 10 to the 12 cells, and you might have, um, what is it in humans, 10 to the 4 that carry those oocytes, all the egg cells a human female will ever need through her lifetime. And I would predict those template mitochondria have all um, derived with the help of the rest uh, of the individual organism uh, from that template and carry it through. Um, they're immortal, if you will. But, well, but that's same. a hypothesis, yeah. and we haven't done it, and we haven't done it because, unlike named professors in Rutgers University, we're doing all this on a shoestring, and some of us <laughs> haven't even got shoestrings. But that's the next, that's, you're absolutely right. We so you need it. two shoestrings? <laughs> what people like you know say is, hey, maybe we could collaborate on this. Yeah, is that... Uh, Uh, John, since this is a hypothesis-driven um, a model of yours, I was wondering if um, is it possible that even on, on organisms, single-celled organisms like Chlamydomonas, which have you know, the question is where where does that mitochondria come? Could you have just maybe one mitochondria in a cell that is actually dedicated to be a germline type mitochondria that may not be respiring? Yeah, because yeah. these cells I, are packed with mitochondria. You have you know hundreds of mitochondria. I think there's, I there think could there's be some dedicated, evidence for that. Uh, ones just for just for transporting yeah. with the chromosome. Yeah, you're on my side then. I mean, that would be a yeah, reply to Chris. There's what no do you do about isochromatic sex? This would be you one. Could, you could have a you could have a small organelle yeah. of chloroplast DNA yeah. that doesn't even doesn't even have thylakoids that could then yeah. be used to transport yeah. into. I think into I a think there's cell. some evidence in support of that. Where's yeast mitochondria, for example? I mean, the yeast cell quite big and it's got lots of mitochondria and yeah. there seems They're to be a with gradient of. They, didn't, they may not all be respiring, but there could be one dedicated. Yeah. If you've only got a single chloroplast, as in Clammy, then, then you're in trouble, I would have thought. Unless there is some chloroplast being sequestered in a small membrane, it doesn't all I guess you can go on postulating smaller and smaller entities that are responsible for it. Um, <laughs> I've got the microphone. Can I take the question? Uh, go on, University of Florida. Florida. So, uh, Clamidomonas is an interesting example. Clamidomonas is actually basically has the physiology of a soil bacterium, though, right? You don't isolate it from ponds. You isolate it from soil. And, um, and it's actually the most versatile anaerobe that we know among the eukaryotes. If you grow Clamidomonas anaerobically, it basically turns into trichomonas and produces hydrogen and acetate. So thinking <clears throat> in that line and having worked a good bit on anaerobic mitochondria myself, I was wondering whether there's not a prediction here because you're focusing on reactive oxygen species that this tendency should be more pronounced among oxygen specialists than among the many protists and some lowly animals that tend to inhibit low oxygen or anoxic environments. So that is, that's something to think about also with respect to, to climate and Just well, a thought. Wilson. Just a thought. So I'm on your side. I want Wilson to say something because he's pointed out that, yeah, the protists that are anaerobic, have anaerobic mitochondria shouldn't have sex, if this is correct. Um, I've said it now. Sorry? Sexes. 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 Separate sexes, yeah. And that's, I mean, do we know this? Does anyone know this is wrong? They have mating types. They have split mating types. Yeah. And mutant kind of inheritance of mitochondria. Hmm. I think, I mean, one, sorry, can I, can I take the mic for a moment? One, I mean, one major difference, John, I, I think is simply population size. So as soon as you have 
uh, as soon as you have large um, organisms with a germline and a soma and so on, um, then selection becomes much more difficult than it is in a very large population where you don't necessarily have to have an inactive template. Um, simply selection in a large population may be strong enough. So there are other factors to consider. I'm not, I'm not opposed to the idea, but, I mean, there are, there are questions. But I, I think you're quite right. You have to focus on the germline. Um, but it doesn't necessarily account, therefore, for two sexes because you still do see two mating types, even in isogametes. So it's a question of how far can you take the interpretation. Yeah, yeah. I'm talking about male and female as we, as we yes. hire organisms to make you feel proud, understand this. And it's pretty well distributed. I mean, they're hermaphrodites as well and, and so on and so on. But uh, that's really what my remit is. I just wanted to put in the, in the middle also the um, mitochondrial cloud and uh, atresia in the sense that all there, it seems there to be a mechanism to uh, select uh, within the germline good mitochondria. Somehow. Right. What are good mitochondria? So, doing oxidative phosphorylation so or doing so, so nothing at all? I would say doing nothing at all. Uh, so think? in the sense, how come they do nothing so they should be well conserved? They have also internal selection to get the best, and still they have a high rate of, of substitution. So, You know, this, I, I just think this is, it's like Darwin said, nature is red in tooth and claw. It's mixing up a scientist with a poet and coming to a silly conclusion. It's not. It's much more subtle than that. You don't have to have a mechanism in oogenesis that says, OK, we're only going to let really high rates of photo oxidative phosphorylation through here. It's looking at it in the wrong way. We don't do that when we make gametes. It's, it's, it's gentler, it's cooperative, it's, it's good. Um, <laughs> do I sound like an ecologist? I'm sorry if so. You know. You're not involved in, in, in restructuring in British universities, for example. Well, I, I mean, I... I'm a little bit puzzled why you, in your model, propose that the adjacent cells provide ATP. And I'm wondering whether you've thought about elevated fermentative metabolism in the other sites. Yes, uh, yeah, and me meta metabolic shuttling that would allow the ATP to be produced by fermentation in the other site. That, I'd be very happy with that. We don't necessarily have to have ATP. Glucose is the answer. Glucose is the answer, but then where do they get their glucose? Circulating... Yeah, but it has to get from the blood to the... Yeah. Yep. Yeah. I think we have to call a halt to it there, otherwise we'll get annoyed. We're annoyed at the staff here. <clears throat> anyway, thanks very much, Brian. Um, thank you very much. 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 Thank you very much